Hello everyone again, and welcome again to PLG Disrupt, another session, another insight. So before I introduce here my friend Matt from Drift, I will just want to say that we have George Nikolaropoulos, who is lead trainer at Product-Led Growth Hub, who will present the main takeaways from the Product-Led Engineering Certification Program. She, uh, he will be at the session stage. So now in the main stage, I have with me Matt Bilotti, uh, who is the product uh, lead at Drift, and he will talk on how to build a product that acquires users. So there are three to five key things that the best products out there do to, to acquire users and grow their product-led efforts. In this talk, we'll discuss some role models, what they do right, and how you can apply the same principle to your product. Packed full of examples, you will be able to walk away with some new tips and strategies for approaching your own product-led initiatives. So Matt, welcome. I give you the floor and you're ready to present. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Hello everybody that is listening. So we're gonna go ahead and jump on in talking about how to build a product that acquires users. And just to quickly reintroduce myself, my name is Matt. I'm a product lead at a company called Drift. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with Drift, it is a about 400 person company in the United States uh, and we build a revenue acceleration platform. So over the years of my time in tech and software and all that, uh, I've helped build and launch many, many different products. Uh, at Drift alone, I think we built and launched about 20 different products. Uh, I worked at HubSpot for a little bit and at a few other startups uh, where we launched a bunch of products. And there are very clear differences around which products we launched that had users get acquired to it pretty quickly uh, versus ones that we launched and nobody cared about and they totally flopped. And so uh, I wanna take a, a, a bit of a walkthrough of, I'm gonna use some examples of what we've uh, done at Drift and the things that we learned there, but also examples from some other companies that I think are role models. So I'll touch on a couple of the quick role models that we'll talk through. Here are the like five core strategies that companies get right, and we'll go through each of them, and I'll talk about examples for each. So those five are market alignment, channels that work for you, and I'll explain what that means in a bit, uh, great acquisition flows, <clears throat> viral loops, and a remarkable product. And of course, this is, isn't entirely all encompassing, right? There's always also uh, like a, you might have a sales motion that acquires users if you're building more of an enterprise product, or you might have uh, a really intensive, uh, you know, marketing team that does all sorts of things. Uh, but I bucket some of that into acquisition flows as well. And then we'll touch on a couple of tips just to wrap it all up. So uh, here are some of my favorite role models of companies that I think do an amazing job acquiring users. So I think you're, you're probably all familiar with most of these, if not all of them. So uh, Dropbox uh, and Zoom are public companies, right? We have a Notion, which is a note-taking app that does way more than just note-taking. Uh, Google Analytics, which almost every website in the world uses. We couldn't possibly be more aware of what Zoom is uh, at this point in time. Uh, Superhuman, an email product. And then Evernote, which is also similar to Notion. It was kind of a earlier uh, earlier take on early note taking on your computer and your phone and whatnot. So let's start with the first core strategy here, which is market alignment. And I think that this is so critically important because nothing else ma matters if your product acquisition strategy doesn't align to the market, right? So you need to think about which strategies are you gonna use because they work in the type of market that you're operating in. So for example, uh, one of the, the other strategies that we'll talk about are viral loops. And, you know, you can't really use a viral loop or referral strategy if you're building a company that is selling, you know, products for companies that are only a thousand people or more, right? You're going to have a sales motion for that type of thing. So I think that there's a tendency to uh, look at, you know, some of the role models that I talked about or other companies that you admire or think, you know, have grown a lot or do great things and say, that worked for them, let's try it, it will, it'll work for us. I think that it's really critical to make sure that it will work for you when the market you're operating in works well for that thing. So one example 
that I see many, many companies do, uh, which is an example of misalignment, is when companies, I've seen it at, at Drift or uh, you know some of the other products or companies I've worked for, where people say, oh, we want to acquire more users, so let's build a referral system, right? The amount of referral systems I've seen are crazy, uh, but the reality is like referral systems only work really well if you're operating in a market where a referral system makes sense and there's already that sort of behavior activity. So an example of where referral systems make a ton of sense and work really well would be something like Uber, right? Referring someone else to catch a ride. Uh, or another example that was really early on uh, in the world of tech was PayPal. So PayPal did uh, refer somebody else and you give them $10 and then you get $10. And that's what most referral systems today are, are modeled off of. Uh, but, there, but you really have to think about like, is the referral activity a thing that happens in my market? And if so, then let's, let's focus on it. But if not, then it's not worth it. And so some other examples of uh, companies that I think do a really good job with this uh, are Superhuman and Dropbox. So just a way to frame it uh, for yourself is to say, like, am I building something that's for enterprise companies? Am I building something for small businesses or consumer? Right. Think about the industry and the type of business model that you have and consider the the types of, uh, of strategies that you could take. Um, and I think all of your product acquisition strategies need to align around this. Right. You can't say, like we're going to do most of these strategies because they align with the market here. And then we're going to try this other stuff. Like you always have to start with who is our market, uh, who are we going after and what, what already works in that market today. Uh, and then an example that I just talked through is viral loops work really well for consumer uh, and small businesses, not so much for en enterprise. So the example that I talked about was um, uh, referral systems, but the same thing goes for viral loops, right? So uh, things where, you know, you see, something that someone else is using and then you sign up for it, right? Dropbox is an example of that. So uh, one, one company that I think does a really special job of this market alignment is a company called Superhuman. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, it is a, um, a email, taking, uh, email app uh, that you use on your computer and your phone and their whole pitch is that it's fastest email experience in the world. Uh, and one of the things that they did when they were launching the product, and I believe they still do it today, is when you say, I wanna use the product, they force you to fill out a survey, which tells them all that they need to know on whether or not you fit in their market, right? So they find out like, what computer am I on? What phone am I using? What browser do I use? How there's tons of other questions that were like, how do you, how do I use email? Do I use it for work? Do I use it for personal? How many times a day do I check email? And so one version of thinking about your market alignment is saying, you know, and building your own strategy to say, we're, we're going to run our tactics for this type of, uh, this type of user, or this type of market, but the other more extreme way to do it, which I think has worked really well for superhuman so far is to say, we are going to explicitly define our market and our strategies around it, and then make sure that we're only taking people into the product that are in that market, because all of the other acquisition strategies rely on that user being a certain, a very specific type of user. Uh, so there are referral systems in Superhuman. I've referred three or four people to Superhuman, but I, I wouldn't expect that you know, my parents would do the same thing if they were to sign up for it. So they start at the top and make sure that they're only accepting people that will operate within all of the other types of acquisition flows that they have. And then another example here for the alignment is you can think about Dropbox. Dropbox has uh, two core markets and different, you know, strategies for each of them. I wouldn't recommend you know, if you're early in your company building, I wouldn't recommend trying to do two of the things out of the gate. It's way more important to have one specific focus, but when you're as big as Dropbox is and you have, you know, hundreds of millions of users and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, in revenue, you could build out two very distinct flows. And so you could see if you are more of a business user, so, you know, I might buy Dropbox for the 200 people at my company, it's a very different type of acquisition flow, right? So the strategy here is get me my company to try it for 30 days 
or to just go ahead and purchase now. Uh, and it's way more of an education type experience. Whereas if they know that I'm showing up to think about Dropbox. So let's, I think we pretty much wrapped up the Dropbox example here, right? Two different flows, two different types of strategies around it. Uh, the next thing I would say is like in order to have a great product that's going to acquire users, you need a really good acquisition flow, right? Like having a strategy is important and having a good sign up page is important or a sign up process. But what matters is all the steps that happen after that moment, right? A lot of, I, I think a lot of folks have a tendency to just focus on like the very, very starting point. Um, but when that is disconnected from everything they've seen so far, as soon as they get into the product or the acquisition flow or experience, um, that's when people usually drop off and leave. So you really have to think about the, the, the entire process as a whole. And so some examples of acquisition flows, one I'll use as Dropbox, uh, and then one as Drift. Uh, and I think the way to think about it is that the product experience and the acquisition flow starts on the website. So you have to think about the website as part of the product experience. Um, because without that, then you wind up in a spot where someone's on the website and they're thinking one thing and they see all these different designs and then all of a sudden they sign up and they think they're in a totally different world, right? The messaging is different. The look is different. The colors are different, right? You have to think about it as a very, very cohesive type thing. Um, so it's important to stay aligned with the marketing team. You know, in some cases for a point in time, uh, you know, you might have a growth team that owns both the marketing website and the product onboarding experience. But if that's not the case, because it's usually not the case, then you need to make sure that the product team that works on all the acquisition flow stuff, all the signups and onboarding and whatnot, are really aligned with the marketing team on what their goals are and what their metrics are and what they're working on. And uh, the way I think about it is that product and growth should own specific funnels, right? So like what usually provides a better experience for the customer and a better acquisition flow overall is when the product team can actually own what the sign up experience looks like on the website, um, because it's a lot harder for the marketing team to own the product setup experience. And it's much easier for the product team to own the marketing sign up experience. So that's how I would recommend setting it up. And it's also really important to be contextual to the source of the sign up or the acquisition, right? So if we think about uh, Dropbox, Dropbox as an example, in a best case scenario, and I'm, they certainly do this well, you want to have the acquisition flow tied to the point at which you showed up. So let's say like there is a very different acquisition experience that should happen or an onboarding experience that should happen. If I go to dropbox.com and sign up, because I want to start sharing files versus if somebody shares a file with me and then I'm signing up to access that file, right? Those are two very, very different experiences. And I think a lot of companies have a tendency to say like, no matter where you're signing up from, everyone goes through the same flow, right? When you do that, you risk a disconnect and you're missing an opportunity to have an even better sign up uh, funnel and sign up flow and more people going through it than uh, if you had made it particular to each of the main signup points. So the way, like if, you, if you're thinking about how do I action this, uh, rather than trying to make 20 new signup flows in your product, I would just start at the top and say, where's the number one place where people sign up? Where's the second most place where people sign up? And like split the flows there, right? Make two. And then if the third most is a really high volume, then you make, a specific one for the third, right? And make them contextual. So this is that example, uh, one of the examples I was just sharing, uh, where instead of me going to dropbox.com and signing up, I am getting a file shared to me. So I go ahead and view, I click to view that file. The email tells me a little bit about what Dropbox is because I maybe I never knew what it was or you know I'm just getting this random email. It's important to clarify what the point of this thing is. And then when I go to view the file, they make it really easy for me to sign up with Google and make it really straightforward. I just need to enter my email and my password versus, you know, if you thought about that other uh, sign up flow earlier, like they ask for a couple other things, which is okay because I'm coming from a place where I want Dropbox, right? Whereas 
if I'm coming from this place, I don't know that I want Dropbox. I'm just being told that the only way I can view this file is if I get Dropbox. So another uh, version of this is something that we did at, at Drift. So uh, as I had mentioned, Drift is like a revenue acceleration platform. One of the parts of the product is a chat widget. So you may or may not have seen it on different websites uh, across the internet. And it looks something like this in the back here. I think you could see my mouse. So one of these squares here. And there's a little button at the uh, underneath that says we're powered by Drift. And so when anyone clicks that on any website where they uh, see Drift, they land on this page. And so the way we thought about this was one, how do we reinforce that they're in the right spot? So that's kind of why we have visuals of the thing that just saw back there. How do we make sure that uh, you know the reason that they're clicking on it is because they're you know usually they're saying, oh this experience is cool. How can I get this on my own website? So then they click on it. So what we want to do is just make it as contextual to that as possible. So uh, want to see the experience you just saw on the website you came from, right? So we personalize this to the website, get started, it's free, and we encourage people to enter their business email address because that's the type of market that we're going after. Uh, and then you can see what Drift looks like on your site, right? And you could also notice that we removed any headers. There's nothing to scroll to, right? Because what more do we want the person to know other than like you can get the thing that you just experienced, right? So in some cases, you want to lead with education and a lot of context. But in this case, uh, it's a it's like a very particular type of action. Uh, and so we want to focus them just on that. Another uh, another strategy here, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, is viral loops. Uh, and again, as I had mentioned earlier, it doesn't work for all products. But it, uh, if you can leverage it, you absolutely need to. So if you work in any sort of consumer type product, like usually there are vi opportunities for viral loops, and it's really important to to double down on those and and build out flows because if you don't get the viral loops right then some competitor in your market will get the viral loops right. And especially in consumer, if someone else, like even if you've been around for two more years, if someone else shows up tomorrow and then within a month, they have like a functioning viral loop, their growth is going to like far outpace yours very, very quickly. So if you have an opportunity for them, it's absolutely something worth investing in. Uh, and I'll talk about uh, mainly Zoom as, the, as an example here. So, um, you, you have to also think about the viral loop as one that aligns with your core product value. So what I mean by this is there are some products where you could try your best to put in a viral loop, but the way that a viral loop works best is when the action of using the product like requires or gains additional benefit from someone else using the product. So Zoom is way higher on the chart of that working for them than it does for us at Drift. Like you don't necessarily need another website with Drift on it, but in order to fundamentally use the Zoom experience, you have to use it with other people, right? So there, there's fundamentally a viral loop baked in there. And so uh, same thing with Notion, which is the note-taking app. Like sure, you can use it by yourself, but it's fundamentally better with other people. and it, the fundamental use case includes other people. Like if your fundamental use case includes other people on the product, then you should be thinking about viral loops in most cases. Um, and so that drives to like more of an inherent virality, which is in order for me to use this, I need you using it also. So we will, you know, just by function of using the product, we're gonna get more people using or like signing up for it versus forced is more like, you're trying really hard to create a viral loop where maybe it doesn't quite exist. And then um, a good way to think about this is leveraging the moments where someone that doesn't use the product already would see or interact with your product. So what's a good example of this? Um, so I think uh, Maybe Notion is a good a good example here, and I think I'll talk about this example in a little bit. But I'll bring it up now because I think it's it's interesting. Is um, Notion? So I can share my uh, notes with you, like I could send you a link to my notes. But what could also happen is uh, my 
a link to my notes, I could just make them public and then people can start sharing them as a resource. So one great example of this is the other day, somebody, I was on a call, a Zoom call with 50 other people. It's funny, using one product to talk about another viral loop. I was on a Zoom call with like 50 other people and somebody had a really intense camera setup and someone asked them like, what, what tech do you use? What camera do you use? What lighting do you use? And somebody, and that person shared a Notion link to somebody else's resource page of here's all the products I use in my desk at home. And it include the camera and the lighting and whatnot. And so when you think about the moments a non-user would see or interact, like I had no intention of thinking about Notion, nor was the current user telling me about Notion, but it got shared in a chat. So the link, seeing Notion dot, dot whatever their thing is uh, in the URL was a good moment for me to recognize it. And then when I go visit the page, like I don't need to sign up for it, but I see that it's, oh, it's, you know, it's this page is built on Notion or whatever it might be. So that's another way to think about it. Um, and so with Zoom, like the inherent virality is uh, you have to have the other person using the tool to get on the meeting. Uh, and then in Drift's case, it's a little bit more of, uh, passive virality, right? We get onto one website, that website has 10,000 visitors. If we get five of those visitors a month to sign up for our product, we start to like feed our own sign up loops. So uh, this is, I think this is the fourth one out of five. So this is channels that work for you. And I think that this is often an overlooked thing. Um, and it's important because there are certain products that align perfectly with acquisition gold mines. So, uh, but there are cases where you might think, I'm gonna just make up an example here. Um, you know, a lot of companies are built on paid ads, right? So they're scaling their business on paid ads through Facebook or whatever it might be. Um, and you might say, uh, well, we can grow on paid ads. We have some, you know, version of it that's working for us that they're paying for their uh, all the ads that we're putting in are, are paying for themselves, but it's really important to to think about the channel as the main point of sign up. So uh, one way to think about it is usually companies operate more on the 80-20 rule of channels. So 80% of all of their users come through one channel. So in uh, in Zoom's example, it's generally going to be people getting invited to meetings and then they have to download it and sign up. Uh, in some other examples like uh, Drift, maybe the, the, the viral link isn't the number one uh, source of signups, but um, SEO is like, that's not actually the case, but you know, um, a company like a real estate website like Zillow, uh, you go on Zillow to find a home that you might buy. Uh, that is definitely scaling on SEO more so than it's scaling on any other, you know, strategies of acquisition, right? Because I go search like homes in whatever, uh, or like a specific house, and then I get the result there. So it's really, really important to think about the channel product fit. Uh, and there's actually a really good resource on this. Uh, you could search for um, channel product fit. Uh, by Brian Balfour, and there's a really good blog post on a website called Reforge. I think it's on Reforge, but if you need uh, help finding it, let me know. Um, so uh, channels that work for you, I think I covered most of this. So think about the distribution channels that you could have. So App Store is a distribution channel, Chrome Web Store is a distribution channel. You can think about communication systems as a channel. So uh, reaching out to prospective users via cold emailing or messaging or you know, direct mail, like physical mail. Uh, you could also think of channels as developer tools. So integrating with other products as a means to get people to find out about your product and sign up. Um, and then there's other platforms or ecosystems. So, and this is similar to the app store type thing where you can build an app on Salesforce and you start to show up on their platform as something people could download and same thing with Slack. Um, and uh, so two examples of this that I think are interesting to touch on. Uh, one is Google Analytics. So if you've ever built a website in any website builder tool, uh, you have seen, you know, be it Squarespace or HubSpot or WordPress or whatever it might be, there's always this like box somewhere in the settings that says, put your Google Analytics code here. Um, and so that is an incredible channel, right? 
like not only are people going to sign up for Google Analytics and trying to figure out how to integrate it, but Google Analytics took the strategy of let's show up as a defaulted setting in all of these website builders. And so when somebody goes in Squarespace and goes to the section that's like website analytics, Google Analytics shows up here and says, put in your Google Analytics code. So people say, oh, I should go sign up for Google Analytics so I can put my code in here. Uh, another example is Evernote. So uh, I don't. some of you may know this, but when the App Store, the Apple App Store launched, Evernote was one of the very few apps that uh, opened in that launch. And because it was one of the very first apps, uh, it grew really quickly. Uh, and it was the, the main note-taking app in the App Store. And so by function of being into a channel first, they get a lot of benefits for that. So I would also think about what are new upcoming channels that you know maybe haven't been leveraged a lot that you could find channel product fit with or channel market fit with. Um, so I don't know, maybe podcast advertising, like there are, there's some opportunity there. There's the Zen Recruiter is doing a ton of podcast advertising. Can't listen to a podcast and not hear about Zen Recruiter. Uh, and so they've like owned that channel, right? So I would think about what are new channels uh, and can you position yourself as one of the first in that channel? And then the last one here is a remarkable product. Like at the end of the day, nothing beats something that is just that good and just that easy to use, right? Because then other people tell their friends about it uh, and you get the word of mouth. Uh, and because it's easy to use, people actually use it. And then because they're actually using it, it fuels any other acquisition flows you might have around virality or whatever it might be. So I think Notion and Superhuman are really good examples of remarkable products. Um, and they clearly spend a lot of time just making the product experience world class. And people notice like uh, anyone who uses Superhuman will probably talk all about how amazing Superhuman is compared to any other email app. And when Superhuman first came out, I was skeptical. I said, what's another email app? They're all the same thing. You look at your emails, and then you mark them as read or unread, and then you move on with your life. But somehow Superhuman's product is actually that much better. And I never thought I'd be paying $30 a month for an email app when Gmail is totally free, but I am. And then here I am <laughs> talking about it in front of all these people as an example of a remarkable product, right? It's the stuff feeds itself. Um, I think you can also solve a problem in a really unique way. So your solution looks different than other solutions and it just simply works better. Um, being the best at something, right? Like Zoom is a remarkable product, not because it has the best user experience of making a meeting, right? Think about uh, during coronavirus, like all the families and older folks that are trying to use a Zoom to connect with their children or whatever it might be, and they're struggling to get it to work for them. But the reality is like Zoom is built on a reliable product. Like they are powering this remote world and the thing never breaks, right? And of course it's gonna break tomorrow because I'm talking about it, but like it really hasn't broken down. And so it's remarkable because it just works. And the fact that the meetings stay up and the audio is good and the video is good, it makes more people wanna sign up for that rather than any alternative. Uh, and then Notion is is similarly. Uh, I think that it, I I don't I don't personally use it a ton, but everyone that I know uses it loves it because they just tell everyone else about it. And when someone hears that someone else is using Notion, they start like trading notes because they just love Notion so much. It's crazy. They built a whole community about it, around how easy the product is to use, and so that's a really really big lever as well. Uh, and then Superhuman, as I had already talked about, is another great example of this. So. Couple additional tips just to wrap up. Um, it's really important to know that something that works today won't work forever, right? Like if you're fueling your acquisition through paid ads, uh, it may not work forever, right? Or if you're fueling your acquisition through SEO, Google and other search engines could make changes that make your SEO traffic drop, right? So while you might get 80% of your signups through one specific acquisition flow, it's important to try out some other things in that 20% so that you're kind of hedging yourself if one of the acquisition channels totally falls apart. It's also important to make sure to measure these users downstream. So maybe you have a viral loop that gets tons and tons of people to sign up, but then none of those people actually use the product. 
like that's not useful to anyone and probably it's costing your business more money to maintain all these users that aren't actually giving you any money or value. And so you have to think about not only how many people are signing up and using it, but are these people using it tomorrow and next week and after that? And then are they paying us, right? You don't want to fuel some like dead end channel that sends you 20,000 signups a month if you're only getting $10 out the other end. Uh, play to your strengths. So think about uh, the type of market that you're in, the type of experience that you have as a team, who has built certain uh, strategies before, uh, what is your company really good at, and how can you lean into that as part of your strategy. Double down on what's working, right? So if you're finding virality is working really well, just like keep doubling down on it. Um, paid ads is maybe the one thing that's dangerous to double down on because then you can really dig yourself into a hole because uh, the cost is so high if the uh, channel stops working. So maybe that's the one I'd recommend to be careful of. Uh, run experiments, like I said, with new channels, see stuff that can work. And don't try to do everything at once, right? Like, sure, you know, the I've talked about these five things here, but usually companies aren't amazing at all of them. Like I actually kind of struggle with the user experience of Evernote, but I use it because they got me really early on in the iOS app store. And then I signed up and I have all my notes there and, and I'm locked in. And it's okay that they're not the best product in the world because they figured out that other channel, right? They're, they're ranking at the top of, uh, you know, app store searches for note taking apps and things like that. So um, most companies get two or three of these things, right? You don't have to try to get every single one, right? Or every single one of them working at any, any given point in time. And then it's also important to work on the funnel in the order that makes sense to your business. Like if you need to start making money, I don't know if viral loops is the place to start. Maybe you need to start with a different type of acquisition flow, like uh, sales, right? And build up a sales motion before you can invest in your, you know, free user acquisition or, or things like that. So quick recap, I shared some of my role models. Uh, it's important for you to find your own, whether they're in your own market or they're similar markets or similar industries. Uh, or just patterns that people are really familiar with, like find who those oral models are and then use them to make your decisions. Like we use, like when we're discussing what we're gonna build and how it's gonna work, we leverage a lot of the examples I talked about to think uh, through what are we gonna do and how's it gonna work. And then those core strategies are market alignment. Your, your strategies have to be aligned with who the market is. Um, find channels that work for you, build great acquisition flows from start to finish. Um, invest in viral loops if you have an opportunity to do it. And then like, again, there's no um, no other alternative to a remarkable product in terms of getting people to talk about something. Uh, and so you can, like what's important to know is you can have a remarkable product, but if you don't have any of these other things, you're not gonna get anywhere. But you can have one of these other things and not a remarkable product and still work. So it's important to think about like the mixing and matching of all these strategies as well. So that is it for me. Uh, just a reminder, I'm product lead at a company called Drift. Uh, that is my email. And then I also uh, host a growth podcast uh, where I interview tons of other folks that talk about acquisition and product led growth and things like that. So uh, just another resource to check out uh, in addition to PLG, Disrupt and many others. Thank you so much, Matt. It was truly really a pleasure having you. Such an insightful presentation as well. Uh, Unfortunately, we don't, we don't have any time for questions right now because we're running late for the next session. But I think the presentation was truly really comprehensive and full of insight. So we really want to thank you for joining us at PLG Disrupt. And I wish you all the best. And we hope that we see you again in the next PLG Disrupt event. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. So for the rest of you, please stay with us for the next. Uh, 10 minutes, maybe less, because uh, yes, approximately five, seven minutes will be uh, together uh, introducing um, Peter Leon uh, from um, Customer Success Network. So stay tuned. <laughs>